Hello, and thanks everyone for uh, joining our panel on AAV manufacturing. I'm Google Lipschitz, a biotech analyst at Chardon, and we're in an important time for the AAV space with some regulatory decisions on the calendar and several programs in late stage uh, studies. But we've also been in a challenging financial environment with companies and investors attuned to cost drivers and spending decisions. Uh, as we know, manufacturing missteps can add considerable costs and delay timelines. Uh, in this panel, we'll talk about the state of AAV gene therapy manufacturing, challenges, innovations, and uh, other key issues in this space. And today with us, we have uh, Dr. Zandi Forbes, President and CEO of Miro GTX, and Faraz Ali, CEO of Panaya Therapeutics. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Uh, the format for the session is roughly 40 to 45 minute panel discussion. And if anyone has any questions, you can uh, submit them in the chat box and we can try to uh, ask them on your behalf. So to start off, uh, could you please each briefly introduce yourselves and your companies and manufacturing capabilities, and then we'll talk a little bit more. And we can start with Zandi and then we can go to Faraz. Uh, thank you, Gula, and thanks for inviting me to be part of your panel again. Um, so I'm the CEO of Mira, which is a broad-based, somewhat broad-based gene therapy company. Um, we have both broad technology and vectorology, as well as six different clinical programs, three of which, including our ongoing pivotal program, are partnered with um, Janssen, with whom we collaborate on, on clinical development, as well as manufacturing. And our partnership with Janssen has not only led us to um, build a platform process, which is, um, we, we think, best in class for manufacturing multiple capsids with multiple genomes. Um, but we also have uh, two viral vector facilities. We have a plasmid production facility, and we are currently um, building up, and by the middle of this year, we'll have a commercial QC center in one of our facilities in Ireland, which will allow us to, in a timely fashion, release material for a potential commercial launch following a BLA next year for our lead product. So um, we have very broad-based manufacturing capabilities. Great for us. Yeah, uh, for us, CEO Tanaya, well, uh, good to be back here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, and um, Tanaya is a, um, in, in some ways, different, uh, the many similarities with uh, what Sandy just said, but also very some some differences. Um, we are a clinical stage, publicly traded biotech company. We are 100% focused on one uh, therapeutic area, and that's heart disease. So we go after both rare and prevalent forms of heart disease. We're also modality agnostic. So actually, a lot of what we do is indeed gene therapy but we actually technically do our drug discovery in a modality agnostic way. And so in our early portfolio, we do have small molecules. And as we discover new targets, um, it could be an antibody, it could be an siRNA, it could be gene editing, and we would uh, follow the science uh, to do what's the right thing for the patients in that particular condition. And we have an early history of that, uh, but a lot of our expertise and capabilities have been built around ADV gene therapy uh, as a starting point. We have chosen to internalize capabilities, including as Sandy mentioned, uh, capsid engineering, uh, promoter and regulatory elements, uh, disease models, um, delivery systems, um, as well as manufacturing. And in our case, uh, uh, we're we're not yet in the clinic with our AAV gene therapies. We have an open IND and anticipate dosing this year. So I look forward to being at the point that Zandi's at today with uh, uh, lots of clinical data under her belt. Um, uh, but we we have uh, two uh, gene therapy programs addressing the leading genetic causes of um, uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, these are large indications, uh, more than 100,000 um, patients in the U.S. for our TN201 program, uh, MyBC3 associated uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and more than 70,000 patients um, in the U.S. for uh, TN401, uh, which is um, PKP2 associated ARVC. So these are large orphan indications, and then behind that, they're they're the programs that would go into potentially more prevalent indications. So manufacturing was important to us. We invested in non-GMP capabilities several years ago. And then more recently invested in GMP capabilities. We have an, um, a facility that's operational, that's producing material at the 1,000 liter scale. Uh, we've produced all the material we need for our first in human studies. Um, and so we're, we're, we're uh, at the cusp of um, dosing patients and uh, seeing the, the, the fruits of our labor. Great. So let's 
start with challenges. What do each of you see as the biggest current challenges relating to AAV manufacturing as the space is today? And maybe I'll start with Faraz and then go to Sandy. Right. I, I would say one of them is that there's still um, a, uh, and, and this may be obvious to some in the audience uh, who are watching here today, but I still think regulatory uncertainty. There's been a lot of very good partnership in the FDA and the regulatory agencies. Uh, I still think that there's more regulatory uncertainty than there should be. Uh, and um, it, it, um, um, uh, we haven't uh, been uh, affected by that. I think we've had very good in interactions with the FDA and in effect our IND cleared very smoothly and we had met the requirements. But talking to my peers, I do get a sense that there's, you know, sometimes it feels like it's a coin toss of like, well, will our IND clear or not? Because a lot of things going on clinical hold for a lot of sponsors, a lot of peers, right out of the gates and that you, the clinical hold at the time of IND is very often related to you know, your manufacturing. So I think getting to a point where there's a lot more certainty about what you need to demonstrate um, at this early stage and then at the next uh, stage, I think the FDA is doing a good job and, and, and getting better at providing more consistent guidance, but still not 100% where I'd love to see it. Um, and, and the delays that Biomarin has experienced on Roctavian, which has gotten approval in Europe, but still not approved in the US is perhaps one, one, one example of that. Uh, and the other uh, major, I think, current challenge is still bringing down the cost of goods. This is particularly less relevant in um, indications of the eye that Sandy, uh, the, her early focus is, but but for, for both of us, if you're going to IV infusions and the volume of drug you need to produce, uh, the, the cost of goods are high. And if you want more price and flexibility and the ability to sort of price at a uh, at, at a at, at a level that um, comfortably clears your cost of goods, it would be great to see COGS come down even further than I think where the industry is today. So I'll pick, I'll start with those two. Um, yeah, I, it's a really interesting question and, and I appreciate your answer, Raz. And what I will say is uh, I'm going to go through your points because they are real challenges. First of all, uh, one of the things that we have learned is that it is very helpful to have a platform process for manufacturing. So we have a proprietary process. We have spent a huge amount of time along with our partner Janssen, in the case of certain products, developing a process that is fit for multiple capsids and multiple vector genomes. And that's an academic endeavor unless you have products that are in the clinic. And what we've learned with our six INDs, and particularly as we've filed for pivotal programs, which is essentially you know, your commercial product, we've had a lot of regulatory interactions with not only the FDA, but also 15, 16 global jurisdictions. And that interaction with regulatory agencies globally through multiple programs at the level of commercialization has really taught us exactly what the agencies need to need and want to see. When we started, we as a, a small company, you know, we were targeting opening an IND, having a process that gave good quality material to put into to patients. And that's great. But what we have achieved over the last seven years is a platform process that we can initiate an IND using this process. And we know that it is fit with potential tweaks for commercialization in the eyes of regulatory agencies. And it's only through the ability to interact with agencies globally, iteratively on multiple programs that we have a much better understanding of what's required to be an acceptable commercial manufacturer. And that is really one of the things that's very important. Now, it's not something you can go out and buy, but being a company that has these six INDs, we're in an unusual position because we have had that interaction with global agencies with, with a very formidable partner, right? Johnson & Johnson has a very strong regulatory team. And 
in that sense, I recognize that there is still risk there, but I think experience in the industry rapidly mitigates that risk because I, I think the agencies globally are consistent in what they're asking for. They're consistent across gene therapy, biologics, and small molecules. And they're really consistent in making sure that you have reproducible processes that make a product which has been shown a comparable product to be safe and effective in your patients. In gene therapy, if you don't start your IND with such a process and such a product, you are at risk of having to open a new IND. So it's a, it's a real hurdle, but experience and time will get each of us over that hurdle. And the FDA as well is learning as the industry files new INDs, you know, what is possible and what they can be flexible on and what their demands will be. Um, I would say it's, it's really important. With respect to cost of goods, absolutely, and scalability. And this is another area that your facility design as well as your process are really important. So we manufacture for indications that um, are small doses. However, all our facilities are all all our facilities, our two facilities were designed and built in collaboration with regulatory agencies to be single use philosophy and a lot of other things. So single use philosophy and scalability means that you can scale by repeating a batch every two weeks, but you can also scale by wheeling out 200 liter bioreactors and wheeling in two days later, 2000 liter bioreactors. So having a process that's scalable and having flexibility with single use philosophy actually gives you inherent scalability. And that's important as well because you don't want completely new process for a larger scale. You want same facility, same room, same operators to achieve this batch to batch consistency in quality, but also yield and the other parameters you're looking at. And, um, and, and both of those I think are really important considerations. I will say that for us in a position where we're looking to commercialization, the biggest challenge in providing material to the clinic and certainly when you're looking at supply chain to supply a commercial product for a rapid and strong launch is QC. It has been extremely challenging in the vendor market today um, and increasingly so to be able to rely on the quality and the timing of your assays, 30 release assays from vendors. And this is across the world, it is, to a small company like us, a large company called like J and J, probably the biggest risk to a launch at this point is having to rely on vendors, and that is the reason that we took the slightly unusual step of setting up a full QC house in our facility in order to internalize full QC for stability and release for our product with Janssen that we hope to launch after the 2024 BLA. And that for us is, uh, that was a, that's a very important challenge for people, timing in the clinic, the, the quality of vendors currently um, in the supply chain can literally put a block. You can get 28 assays back in eight weeks or three months. And some, some vendor will come and say, sorry, we can't give you your assay for six months. It's that sort of scale of delay. So that's a, that, that's a challenge that we're overcoming again by internalization. I, I really appreciate Sandy's comments here because very often we get into these and, and I know we'll look, it's a question we'll probably address is, you know, you know the decision to go in-house versus outsource 
And very often the question, almost inherently what's being posed is the question about production, which is the C, you know, and we say like, well, CDMOs can do that, right? We're talking about the bioreactor and, and, and my guess is Sandy and I will both say, well, you know, we, we stand by our decision to internalize that. But what Sandy is painting a picture that's much broader. When we talk about internalization, there's so many steps in that chain. And um, it's not as simple as saying, we're gonna outsource the production of the initial batch or the, the GMP batches you know, to uh, a CDMO. It's these other steps in the chain, like you're, you're pointing out QC and analytics, right, is uh, so critical. And, um, and so we need to probably have a more nuanced conversation about, you know, is it a binary all or none, right? Do we have to internalize everything to have full control end to end? Are there parts of it that are getting better to, to be able to internalize uh, or to, uh, you could externalize it, but these parts you're always going to want to keep internally. I think, you know, that'll be a good discussion for us to have, Willa, because uh, very often people are just thinking about one point in the, in the chain, which is production. Yeah. And that, that's actually, you, you, yeah, that's really important because as you, if you're a company with a pipeline um, rather than a CDMO, you have very intimate regulatory interactions and you don't get that with a CDMO. So there is an argument that CDMO can take over manufacturing once you have an agreed commercial process that can tech transfer. But as you're going through development, your clinical development is matched by, you know, the manufacturing regulatory interactions. And there are a lot of hurdles to those communication paths when there's a CDMO in the middle. Um, so it's important to consider what's internal and when, um, rather than this blanket statement, external, internal manufacturing. It's a really good point. So kind of building on that, I guess, you know, you, you both have obviously invested in the internal facilities as you've outlined. Is there anything that you would have done differently? And kind of, can you give us some additional color on how you made those decisions? And if you were, again, if you were starting today, is there anything that you would do differently? I'm actually going to let Zandy go first, because I think in the process of her, her responding, right, it, it is partly, you know, this is going to partly set the and why would I not do things differently than the choice of going, having to step on the, the treadmill of internalization uh, of capabilities. She's already been very articulate on this. So, you know, the, the long story short for me is no, but there's, you know, nuance to that. And uh, so Sandy, why don't you build on where you were? And then I'll, 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 I'll add to it. I would say in, in the time that we have done what we've done, I don't think, well, I, I would not have done things differently. And you'll appreciate that uh, we initially built manufacturing internally, acquired the facilities, worked with regulatory agencies to build facilities. But really importantly, in parallel, we have a very big MSAT group that developed the process. So those were good decisions and we wouldn't be where we are today if we hadn't done both of those. Now, internalization of plasmid uh, was kind of out of necessity because you have risk in both quality and timing for your material. And we decided to build a separate facility for that as we had a partnership that we were responsible for manufacturing, right? You can't just rely if you're supplying something. So that happened out of necessity and and then, as I've just described, QC, we, we never were going to be a QC testing house. But as we looked at a potential launch with our partners um, and looked around the world, the current state of QC in the world necessitated that if we wanted to have a strong launch and we wanted to supply this market, somehow our product that we've made had to be tested. And it wasn't that it was a decision, yes or no. It was, there is no alternative at this moment in time. So I, you know, it, it's been a um, huge learning experience and building the platform with these particular drugs for manufacturing has then laid the way for something that I think is 
really critical for a gene therapy company at this moment, which is be able to open INDs with a product that you have a process which can go forward to phase two, phase three and commercial in the facility, with the process, with the people, with end to end. And at this moment, that from a timing and risk perspective is a very valuable thing for any pipeline. So did we plan it exactly as it's happened? No, but whether we made decisions strategically or out of necessity, I think that uh, I'm happy with all the decisions we've made. Yeah, I, and and, uh, and and partly for many of those reasons, you know, we're comfortable with the path that we've gone on. I'll also draw on my past experiences, uh, both at Bluebird and Regenix. Now, those are earlier days in the gene therapy uh, space, uh, and 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 the work at Bluebird was particularly complicated because that that was ex vivo lenti um, uh, autologous, you know, genetically modified cells. But um, at each uh, at each step along the way in both of those companies, and then early experiences here at Tanaya, we have had um, uh, enough disappointments with um, with CDMOs where you're, you you went through all the effort to sign a contract, you've you you signed an agreement, you paid a good amount of money and then uh, to see something as sim simple as like your master cell bank being delayed because they had that they, they needed three goes at it. Uh, so uh, obviously CDMOs have, I think the capacity has improved, but capacity isn't the same as quality and consistency. Capacity, higher capacity, higher supply hasn't necessarily meant lower costs because to be a CDMO, you need to have a certain infrastructure and that implies a certain amount of overhead. And so it's not like with the influx of new capacity, suddenly prices came plummeting down for uh, engaging with a CDMO. So, um, and, and that, and, and whereas at a, at a CDMO, you know, something goes wrong and then you're just left kind of tearing your head and like, what happened here? And like, how quickly can you slot us? And, you, and uh, when it's something happens here, it's part of a learning process, right? You actually learn from that and then you get better at that and you can implement corrections that benefits that particular run or campaign or product, but also benefits the rest of your portfolio. Then you just don't get that with, I don't believe with the CDMO. Now, I wish we had a CDMO. This is not fair because we don't have a CDMO here to counteract all, all the points that Sandy and I are making. Um, and clearly there are people who are doing good work in CDMOs and, and, you know, I, th I believe Sarepta is relying very much on CDMOs for the launch of their, what is a widely anticipated, one of the most widely anticipated AV gene therapy approvals. So they've clearly made a different bet and 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 we don't know whether they've regretted it or not so far, but um, so it is clearly possible to do things. Um, I do like the nuance that Sandy offered earlier, which is there's probably a stage of where you get past the point of learning and you get to the point of like, and now this is it, this is my platform process. And now for a variety of reasons, it could be for risk mitigation, for capacity to have sort of flex capacity. It may make a lot of strategic sense to take your proprietary process and to transfer that and be very hands-on about that to a CDMO so that you, you don't have to build your capacity to meet launch expectations because that will require you to build quite a bit, but you can have flex capacity, which also helps reduce risk so you're not relying on one facility. Uh, which I've lived through, and Sandy and I talked about that before this meeting. Um, so there's a, I, I, I think the ultimately this in steady state of my guess is that we want to have a combination of in house internalized capabilities plus a suite of trusted CDMOs where you have a relationship where you feel that if you transfer your process to them, they'll do it um, at, at a reasonable price for flex capacity and for risk mitigation. Um, so that's where I think things are going to go for us. Uh, even though we do have the ability to flex, we've built our facility in a way that's modular so we can scale out and scale up very much as, as our portfolio and our pipeline. We didn't overbuild, which is another mistake some people do. Um, so don't regret the choices we've made because we've put that first step on the treadmill of learning and then we're going to learn more. You know, Talk to me when I have six INDs under my belt like Sandy does and I'm, you know, I'll, show, I'll be saying very many of the same things. But there's a, there is a point at which you probably need to have CDMOs and excess capacity as part of your strategy and risk mitigation. Um, so that's that's probably where uh, we're we're going to go. And capacity is not the same as 
quality. I mean, I'll just hammer that home over and over again because people keep on saying, well, there's so much more capacity now. Capacity is not the same as consistency and quality and cost and control. Yeah. Agreed. Got it. So, you know, it sounds like there's more, there is more capacity available uh, online, whether um, among CBMOs as well as several uh, companies having built out internal manufacturing. Um, again, whether or not that, that translates to and some of those other, other factors that you mentioned remains to be seen. Um, are there other challenges uh, that you've noted in the selling gene, in the AAV uh, space that people have talked about for the past several years that also seem to be either resolved or nearly resolved or um, maybe just exaggerated? Hmm. I, I mean, people were talking about capacity and mm -hmm clearly more capacity, but unless you have processes that give you high quality, consistently produced product, it, you know, having capacity is not useful. So as we've just heard, I think that there is still work to be done in many areas on process. And, and any vector may be more difficult to manufacture than any other. And I think that internally that work to optimize yield and quality is much easier, is, is much more efficient um, than going directly to a CDMO. So I really agree that the capacity issue has gone away but it doesn't mean the amount of good product being made has increased that much because it's not about bricks and mortar and bioreactors it's about the very details of your process and how they match what the FDA and global agencies are looking for and that comes with iterative development and iterative discussions. And, and I'll, uh, I, I'll add to that, um, like, like Sandy and, and, and the folks at Mira, we have, at this point, we have um, produced many different capsids uh, just because we need different capsids for different applications. And we're also doing capsid engineering efforts. So we've screened more than a billion variants in-house for novel capsids for the heart um, and have had some success there. Um, and we also tinker with promoters and regulatory elements. And um, every time we're not at the point, Sandy, where we have a, what I would call a platform process that would absolutely always work consistently in terms of if you specify these are our ideal product attributes, whether it's empty, full, and partials, um, or it's the yields or whatever those are, um, we're not yet at a point where I can say that I know with 100% certainty that whatever promoter or regulatory element we adopt into the gene cassette and whatever capsid we choose to nominate from our extensive capsid engineering efforts, that it's going to work beautifully the first time, right? Uh, and and um, so I don't know, you know, that, that just may be time and maturity to get to that point. Um, so, so then you're left with a choice, right? It's again, going to the point, it's not about capacity. It's also about the know-how and what you'll learn technically at the intersection of research and manufacturing, even early on, before you even get into ID enabling studies. And so, for us, it works very well. We have research and our non-GMP labs co-located. Like they're separated by a wall, but they're literally next to each other. And there's crosswalk and cross chatter there. I mentioned this on my, my fireside chat yesterday. And then the same people from our PD labs, you know, many of them can get in a car and drive, you know, 45 minutes away to our GMP facility. And there's cross chatter from GMP to non-GMP. That works for us because of the cycles of learning. Uh, I don't know if we can replicate that with a CDMO. Right. And, and honestly, I don't. And to be fair to them, I, I uh, it's possible that some of them are willing to do it. It's just maybe they're few and far between. Maybe it'll cost an arm and a leg. Maybe there's a certain a little bit of uncertainty. But where the field has evolved, mostly people aren't looking for that. Mostly people, when they are using a CDMO, they're like, well, you got the expertise. I am buying your consistent track record of delivering products. So that's like, you know, I pay you money. You know, you give me something. Right. And, 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 and um, 
that might very well work for some people on some products. Uh, I don't know if it's it would have worked for us and based on what I know from our last six years here. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that the part that it is still very bespoke at some level is still, you know, I don't think that's overblown. I think if you're doing innovation, you're working on novel capsules, regulatory elements, you're tweaking conditions to improve infectivity, you're scaling up to 2,000, 5,000 or beyond, uh, that's not the stuff that the average CDMO can reliably just hand, it's, it's not a turnkey off the shelf kind of capability. And so I don't think that part is overblown. I think that is still a very real um, uh, phenomenon. And putting aside the bioreactors, potency assays, really sort of understanding how you're going to make sure you, 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 you know, this is where the FDA is really focused on. And again, that's a different group of people. Maybe, you know, it's, 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 it, maybe it's not your Alonza and Wuxi and whatnot. It's a different group of people that you need to interact with uh, there. So again, it's work for us to internalize that and have that internal, internal uh, analytical development capabilities. Um, each product can be quite different um, than, than, than the other, even though there's some standard compendium assays. So uh, I, I would say potency assay is not overblown and the amount of sort of handholding and learning that you have to go through with, you know, novel capsids, novel products, not, novel regulatory elements, it's not overblown. These are still very real things that require time, patience, innovation, science, and, and I don't know if the average CDMO is set up to offer all of that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with what you've said. The And in our experience, obviously, we've manufactured six clinical products and uh, a number of other preclinical products, and we have a non-GMP vector core. And it is very, very clear that each capsid and in combination with each genome has a different propensity to package. So when you have a platform process, I would say there is no platform process that is optimal for every capsid and every genome. An example is AAV2, standard AAV2. We manufacture, we, some years ago, we tested an AAV2 that we had our, our Parkinson's program with 27, 30 something AV2 ligands, none of them bound. We don't actually do that anymore, but it was a, why isn't it behaving like AV2? Because it had a different genome in it. And we, when we're developing capsids, when we're, de when we're optimizing our vector genomes, the first thing we do before we move forward with a capsid is after we've done our screens, can you actually manufacture? And we reject if even in pots of virus, something is really hard to manufacture, right? You hold, you store it because it's a, it, it's a problem and every capsid is different. Now, a platform process with data lakes looking at many different capsids and many different vector genomes, you get an understanding of where your levers are in your process. Um, and that's important. Again, you learn from every single product that you produce. And from an assay perspective, uh, certainly the potency assay is the one that you generally get questions on. Um, our non-clinical group, our preclinical group, our proof of concept group have for every product m produced our potency assays. One of the things that is important about process uh, potency assays going into pivotal and commercialization is in vivo goes to in vitro. And so there's a huge amount of work creating, validating potency assays and if you think about this, this is highly related to the vector genome because the potency assay has to be, if it's not in vivo, it has to be in cells that will express using the regulatory elements that you have in your vector. So it's completely part of your preclinical, it's, it's mm -hmm. part of your pre-proof of concept yep. to look at every base in your vector and understand how it impacts your manufacturing and 
how you're going to use it in ultimately potency assays, as well as VG, you know, your, your titer assays, your infectivity assays. So they're very closely linked. And one of the reasons we've been able to develop these processes and, and take things to GMP is just like you've said, we have an MSAT lab on one floor, preclinical lab on another, and the GMP facility, our first facility is underground in the same block. So there's total cross fertilization. Something happens in MSAT, something happens in QC, they talk to each other, MSAT develops assays that go in to QC for GMP and it makes that learning which I mean we really are at the beginning of AAD manufacturing just mm -hmm. happen so much faster and we also have a partner right so it's transatlantic discussions constantly around all of the issues we've talked about which just you know the synergy increases the speed of learning and the ability to produce products in a consistent way and, and assay them. I know we're down to a few minutes here, so we'll, we'll let you pick from your remaining questions. <laughs> we haven't yet gotten to what you want to close with. Well, well I think we've talked about a lot of the, the key elements. You did talk about um, costs a little bit, and that is, as I mentioned, top of mind for many in kind of the current climate. So how are you thinking about the ways that we can make gene therapy cheaper and kind of what are realistic aspirations on this front? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just say it, it's, it won't happen by itself. I'm stating the obvious here, right? It, I think everything that Zandi and I have been talking about here, you're gonna have to be really, really deliberate about that, right? And, and, that, and, and that's gonna require tinkering with, you know, even to going all the way up to your starting materials, right? And your, you know, producer cell lines or whatever, things that can allow you to, you know, produce reliably um, and scale up robustly and easily and get to those higher yields, um, uh, even at much larger scale production antibodies, right? Today, we take it for granted that we can produce, you know, antibodies in 20,000 liter, you know, not just one, but like football farms of, you know, football fields of 20,000 liter bioreactors from, you know, Genentech, right, up here in Northern California, uh, we take it for granted that we went through an evolution and early on the field of monoclonal antibodies suffered from some of the same, you know, challenges of manufacturability. So it's going to require deliberate intent. And I think that deliberate intent will come from the innovators because they will have that sense of urgency and unmet need. So I, I, I do think we'll get there. We've gotten there in every other field, um, whether it's, you know, antibodies or enzyme replacements or peptides or small molecules. I think we'll eventually get there for, for, uh, uh, certainly AAVs, I have, uh, have a little bit different feelings about ex vivo lenti autologous cells um, and, and getting the cost down there. So I think uh, we'll get there. I, I, I do believe we'll get there, but it's going to require, and it's going to probably require some of us working together to, to crack some nuts um, and, and, and working together in a way that we haven't yet, um, you know, speculating. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's true of the current tr plasmid transfection or or the current processes that are being used for clinical and potentially commercial process. One of the things that we're doing at Mira is we have a, um, a RNA shape, a riboswitch based mechanism for controlling gene expression in a very granular way with up to 10,000 fold dynamic range, which compares to two, three, four, five fold dynamic range in most regulation systems. And we're building cell lines where rep, cap, helper are tightly, tightly controlled by small molecules. And this degree of control of the gene expression within your producer cell lines actually has the potential to vastly improve your yield, your full ratio, your rate of production, all the things that we look at, transfection, cat packaging, they're very timing based. And to us, this is a very, very powerful tool to really be able to control like an orchestra, 
the the timing of the genes that we express. I mean, we are working, we work in HEC and our entire platform was developed in HEC. So we have this technology that we developed to control in vivo genetic medicine that is just now being applied to creating much more efficient cell production in in our case we've done aav but it can be applied to cho it can be applied to biologics manufacturing so when we think about how to make things cheaper higher yield better quality that's a, a big leap that is a different type of process that we're working on with this very innovative technology that we've developed for other reasons and we've taken one further step and said, you know, we don't know what will be the op optimal platform uh, for that, um, bringing down the cost and the consistency, all the things that we're looking for. So internalized HEK and uh, SF9, as you know, Gula, and we work with both. And our early production is with SF9 because we like the scalability advantages there, but we're actually actively working. And I think over the course of this year, we'll see presentations from us just showing that we're actively working on um, tinkering with both of those platforms. In an ideal world, I wish there was somebody I could go to and say, like, can you solve this problem and come back to me with a solution? But kind of per everything we've talked about today, I think we are, there, there's nobody yet emerging there to say, we've got this, we've nailed this, we've figured it out. If somebody does, they will make a whole lot of money and they will be on the next panel here next time. <laughs> the latter obviously right. being most important. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So it sounds like, you know, look, looking a few years ahead, you envision some of these you know, technologies, whether it's, you know, advanced producer lines or, or um, other elements that could change the way, um, you know, AAV uh, gene therapies are manufactured. Is that fair to say? Is there just the last so. minute or so? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a huge amount of potential technology that can be applied to this and other manufacturing processes. And I'm really optimistic that we're just at the beginning for AAV. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and that'll be, for me, I guess a closing comment is, I think we're at a moment in time where some investors, some VCs are like, well, let's jump to the next big shiny thing, which is like non-viral delivery. And we're interested in non-viral delivery as well. But be, as a result of some of the challenges of the field of viral delivery, and I think that's, uh, it's natural for people to always think about the next horizon, but um, there's so much to be accomplished right here with what we have. We are finally at a point after decades that we have products that are delivering good to patients. There are immunogenicity problems that we are learning about and learning how to mitigate, manufacturing problems that we're learning up, learning how to address. Um, you know, trying to leapfrog to a completely different platform outside of the space versus working with the space. I mean, I would say it's like, it's kind of like, it would have been like Al Nylum abandoning, you know, their 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 approach to you know, getting RNA delivered, you know, ten years into it. It's like, ah, this is not panning out. Or, or Genentech and others in the monoclonal antibody space artificially pulling the plug ten years into it. You know, they 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 persevered. They broke through the problems, and that's what allowed these modalities to take off. Whether it's antibodies or RNAi, I think the same is going to be true for AV gene therapy. And once we crack those nuts, the potential is. Um, uh, it's, it's quite broad and quite great, uh, whether it's delivering of gene editing and other uh, therapeutic proteins, uh, or it's uh, going into prevalent indications. I truly believe that the uh, the future is bright, but it's going to require a few good uh, a few good companies like uh, like uh, what Sandy represents and hopefully what Tanaya represents, kind of persevering, following the science, and uh, doing what's right for patients. All right, great. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of our session. So I'd like to thank you both for participation and the great discussion that you guys had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gula. Thank you. Take care. Bye, friends.